Now question 2D, we've got to solve this guy. Now, <coughs> um, we're solving by factoring. We went in 2A, we went over the steps. The first step is get 0 on one side. So how would you get 0 on one side? Well, we already have it. So step 1 is already done, that's good. Step 2, factorize. How would we factorize this? Can you see a greatest common factor that you can pull out from everything? Does 2 go into everything, right? So if you pull a 2 out from everything, then what would you have? 2 times what gives x 2x squared? 2 times x squared, right? 2 times what gives negative 4x? Negative 2x. 2 times what gives plus 2? plus 1, right? So we have this equals 0. Now once again, when you're asked to factorize, when you got to factorize, you keep going until the end. You can't just factorize one thing out and then stop. If you look at this trinomial, we can actually keep factorizing this. This is re with a reverse spoil method, or a short method, right? So what we do is we list the pairs of factors of 1. What two numbers multiply to 1? How about, you know, just 1 times 1? So what we're looking for in this are two numbers that multiply to positive 1, but then they add to give negative 2. What two numbers multiply to positive 1 and add to negative 2? When you add them, you get negative 2. When you multiply them, you get positive 1. How about negative 1 and negative 1? If I add them, I get negative 2, don't I? What happens when you multiply them? Do you get positive 1? Right? So this blue trinomial actually becomes x minus 1 times x minus 1, right? But you still have the greatest common factor of 2 here. That doesn't disappear, and that equals 0. Are, have we got the trinomial completely factored now? Right. So we've, we're completely factorized, right? The third step is if a times b is zero, then a is zero or b is zero, right? So we don't exactly have that. When people get so confused when they have a two here, right? But all you have to think of is this: look, either this is zero. If this is got, if this whole thing equals zero, either this has to be zero or this thing has to be zero. The 2 is never going to be 0 anyway, but who cares about the 2? Because look, it's just been multiplied by, like if this was 0 out, that's been multiplied by 0 anyway, so it doesn't really matter. And you can't exactly go, well, either 2 is 0 or the x minus 1 is 0. I mean, for goodness sake, 2 is never 0. So you don't do that either. So you can see that, I mean, you can just ignore the 2. Because for this to be equal to 0, you just want either this factor or this factor to be 0. So we have the x minus 1 is 0 or the other x minus 1 is 0, right? And so when we solve these equations, what do we get? We add 1 to both sides and we get x equals 1 or what? Add 1 to both sides and we get x equals 1. So x equals 1 or 1? Which is the answer? What is the answer here to this whole question? Well, like, what does this mean, 1 or 1? Sure, the answer has to be just x equals 1, and that's it. Right? How many solutions do we have? One solution. One solution. x equals 1. Right? Which is kind of interesting, because in the previous, in 2c, we found that we had, when we did 2c, we found we had three solutions, even though th to solve it was kind of the same, but it was just that each of these factors gave a different solution. Like, in other words, if you plugged 0 in here, it zeroed out. If you plugged 1 in for x here, then 1 minus 1 gave us 0, and the whole thing was 0. Or we could have plugged 4 in for x, and then 4 minus 4 is 0. So those are our three solutions, 0, 1, and 4. But in 2D, in 2D, when we got to this point, the only thing we could do is plug a 1 in for x, you see? And then if we plugged a 1 here or here, 
then the whole thing would be zero. So the only number that makes this whole thing zero is just the number one. That's why we just have one solution, x is one, right?